Look now, if you will, 2 Peter chapter 3, and look again, please, at verse 9, where the Bible says this, the Bible says, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men slack, uh, count slackness, but is long-suffering, it says, to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, as I speak tonight on navigating through Calvinism, I want us to understand some things about Calvinism. I'll give you a definition. And then uh, with the definitions that are given about Calvinism and what they believe, as we cover some of the doctrines that they say is the stance upon, we'll also look at some verses to be able to equip us to be able to understand what God says about the matter. Personally, I know men that hold to that which is the theory of Calvinism, uh, but they've not allowed that theory that they hold to to command them not to preach the gospel. They still believe in preaching the gospel to every creature. And by the way, these men are good men. They're faithful men. They're fervent men. They're soul winners. Uh, but still, uh, they hold to at least the, the theological system, if you will, of uh, what Calvinism is about. Now, they don't use it, again, let me reiterate, they don't use it as an excuse to negate the responsibility that they have individually to be able to give out the gospel so that people can come to know Christ as Savior. Unfortunately, most that believe in Calvinism is not that way. Most of the people that do believe in Calvinism believe in the doctrines of Calvinism whereby it causes them not to be soul winners. It causes them not to have a desire to be able uh, to practice evangelism. I believe Augustine probably was the first one that came out with what I would call the doctrine of Calvinism. However, it was named after John Calvin. It was during the time where you had the Protestant Reformation. And by the way, Baptists uh, were not a part of that which was the Reformation, was not a part of anybody that was coming out. We're not Protestants, we're Baptists. There's a big difference between a Protestant and a Baptist. Uh, we never had to protest anything coming out. We had the right doctrine to begin with. However, uh, you see that there were those that were protesters. That's uh, those that came out of the Reformation. And, uh, and those that were protesters, the Protestant uh, reformers, if you will, or the Protestants as they came out called the Reformation, uh, they protested some things. Uh, Calvinism is that, of course, started by John Calvin, named after his namesake. And so Calvinism holds, if you would, uh, to the belief that there is little grace or limited grace, limited grace, limited atonement, a limited amount of God's love, and it is an unchanging plan that does condemn a multitude of people to the lake of fire and to hell. Uh, there's what we know as five-point Calvinism. In our generation, I believe, and I'll reiterate again, sadly enough, it hinders soul winning. It's, it hinders that which is evangelism. It's just a, a very sad source of somebody that has intellectual pride enough to stoop them whereby they do not practice uh, that which is a more and greater wholesome belief in being personally accountable in giving out the gospel. Hyper-Calvinism says that sinners are totally depraved and they're incapable of repentance, or if you would please, an acceptance of that which is the truth of receiving Christ as Savior. And they're predestined, some to heaven, and some to hell. Uh, Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, the Bible talks about God saying this, God is uh, giving us that which we need to understand where he says, now commandeth, it says, all men everywhere to repent. And so God says every man is supposed to repent, not some, and then some others not. So there's no predestination, if you will, and I'm gonna explain uh, predestination election here in just a little bit. But what I like to do is I like to take as, as somebody that would explain or try to explain that they are a Calvinist, uh, will use an acrostic tonight, uh, a, a tulip that explains 
five points of Calvinism. And of course, of course, there's, there's five letters in the tulip, and uh, this is how they explain themselves. And by the way, this is how others look on and explain as well. So let's take the T tonight in the word tulip as we look at the acrostics, and that is total depravity. Total depravity. So what Calvinists believe is this, that man is so depraved that he is incapable of accepting God's gift of eternal life. That man is, is so depraved that he is incapable of accepting God's gift of eternal life. Uh, that a person uh, must, uh, uh, in fact, first be saved in order or before they can believe. Now, that is not what the Bible teaches, and this is why I disagree with that. Uh, over in the book of John, chapter 5 and verse 40, the Bible says, and uh, ye will not come, uh, listen to what it says, and ye will not come, it says to me, that ye might have life. So there's man's choice. We understand tonight that uh, uh, the, the Calvinistic view is that man is totally uh, depraved, if you will. There's the depravity of man, and uh, a man that is totally depraved without God has no hope unless they are part of the elect. All right, Matthew chapter 23, and in verse 37, the Bible says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, it says, Thou killest the prophets, and stonest, it says, them which are sent to thee. How often would I have gathered, it says, thy children together, even as a hen gathereth uh, her chickens under her wings, and ye, listen to it now, and ye would not. All right, so he said, look, I'm, I'm trying to do this, but ye, there's the man's choice, ye would would not. All right. So man has a choice. Now, both of these verses I read a moment ago, uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 40, uh, in the book of, uh, I'm sorry, John chapter 5 and verse 40, Matthew chapter 23 and verse uh, 37, uh, where the Lord Jesus here is indicating that salvation is rejected because of the choice of the sinner. So salvation is rejected because of the choice of the sinner. Okay, uh, I pass out tracks all the time. You know I do, and I pass out tracks all the time. So I go up and I hand somebody a track. At the very split second in time, I hand them a track. They have the right to say yes or no. Okay, now that is their choice. I hope every person would say yes, but can I tell you, not all do. You know why? Because they make a choice. So it's, it's not a matter of the sinner's incapability. Uh, it is a matter of the sinner's willingness. The sinner's willingness. Now, we know this to be true. I read it, I think, at the very beginning, our text verse, which I'll reiterate a little while longer, uh, that, uh, uh, that God is not willing that any should perish. Now, so we see the will of God, the, the wording there, will. God is not willing that any should perish. The will of God is that nobody should perish. But what? That all should come to repentance. By the way, uh, just like these who embrace that which is Calvinism in the most general way and in the, 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 the greatest multitude that embraces that which is the doctrine of Calvinist, can I tell you that they are not soul winners. They are not evangelistic. And they use that as their excuse. Well, God is the one that's going to choose who's going to go to heaven, and God is the one that's going to choose who is going to go to hell. But that's not what our Bible teaches. Uh, we understand this, that uh, there's the T for tulip, as I'm giving you the acrostic, and that is a total depravity. Uh, look at the U, unconditional election. Unconditional election. Now, what does it mean uh, to have unconditional election? Well, uh, what the Calvinists believe is this. Uh, since all men have fallen in Adam, then that means that all men are not saved. So, therefore, it must be the will of God that some men remain lost. Now, let me read it to you again. Since they believe that all men are fallen in Adam and that all men are not saved, then it must be the will of God that some men remain lost. Now, can I tell you that is not true? Now, let me tell you why I disagree with that. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. Here's what the Bible says. It's always good to go back to the Bible. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, the Bible says, for whom uh, he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Now, wait a minute. So he foreknew, 
and he also did predestinate. Now, why is it that he foreknew and he also did predestinate? Well, read the rest of the verse. Don't leave it hanging. The Bible says to be conformed to the image of his son. All right, so wait a minute. This is talking about somebody that is saved, and God said, I want you to know that I foreknew, and I also did predestinate that you be conformed to the image of my own beloved son. Whenever you read about predestination, you look it up, and if you'll read it contextually, if you'll look it up, the word predestination and also the word election is not dealing with a lost sinner. It is dealing with a saved person. And almost every single time that you read the word predestination in your Bible, if you'll read it contextually, that is, read the whole chapter, don't take it out of context, don't read just one verse and try and build a doctrine on it, but if you'll read it in context, here's what you'll find out. If you'll just keep reading that just a little bit, you're going to see what they're predestined to do. Now, in most cases, bar none, That predestination that you're reading about has to do with their service. Their services that they render uh, over, if you will, you'll see uh, here. You'll see in the book of uh, uh, the book of uh, Matthew, or I'm sorry, the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 13. You know it well. You're a soul winner. Uh, The Bible says, uh, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right? Uh, Whosoever. Whosoever. That means anybody. Uh, it, it, uh, it is not something that is an uh, unconditional election, but anybody can be saved. Now, if you'll check it out in your Bible, I believe you'll agree with me when it comes to that word, which is predestination. It's talking about in this particular verse, in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, where it's talking about being conformed after salvation has nothing to do with salvation. And you can almost get that just by reading the verse and understanding the way God has it laid out. But also you'll see this. It's not talking about conforming to salvation. It's talking about now that you are saved, conforming to the very image of Christ. In other words, now that you're saved, live like it. Now that you're saved, act like it. Now that you're saved, walk like it. Let the world see it on the outside if it's true on the inside. So there's the total depravity of man. There's the unconditional election. How about this one? There's a limited atonement. Now, aren't you glad? I'm talking about the tulip tonight using the acrostics and giving you a definition of that which is, uh, I believe, an undoctrinal stance that people call Calvinism. All right. And so uh, there is the L and that is a limited atonement. Now, what is it that Calvinists believe about uh, that which is a limited atonement? Well, uh, the Calvinist believes this, uh, that uh, if it were God's will that everyone should be saved and all men are not saved, then Christ did not die for all. Did you get that? A Calvinist believes that uh, if it was God's will that all men should be saved and all men are not saved, then Christ did not die for all. And and by the way, that's how they skirt around different scriptures. Now, they believe this, that Christ only died for the elect, only died for the chosen. Okay, but let's use just a simple verse. Can we do it? Let's bring it down to elementary form, if we may, so that even a boy or a girl in third grade could understand. The Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All right? And so we understand that it is not a limited atonement. It says, uh, For whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. 1 John chapter 2 and in verse 2, the Bible says, And he is the propitiation for our sins. Listen to it now. Very good verse. And it says, And not for ours only, but also, it says, for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus Christ died for the whole world. He didn't die for just an elect few. He did not die for those that were chosen. Uh, He died for the whole world. All right? And so you can color it any way you want to color it, and you can try and qualify all the theological terminology that you wish to try and qualify. But when you get right down to what the Bible teaches, the Bible teaches most clearly and very plainly, as Jesus Christ said, that uh, Christ died for the world. Jesus, now thank God for that. 
because he died for everybody in the world. Now, if that was not true, we're wasting our time running buses. If that was not true, then you and I are wasting time or we pass out a gospel track. That was not true, why in the world am I wasting all my energy and it seems like that life is going by very short because I take those long mission trips and it zaps everything out of me that a man would not want zapped out of him. Why in the world do I do such a thing if it was just something, well, they're going to be saved anyway. No, they're not going to be saved just anyway. And yes, they do need a soul winner. Yes, they do need a caring Christian. And by the way, I don't care who you are tonight. There's no excuse for you not giving somebody a gospel tract that you care about. Now, I'm saying this, that God offers uh, that which is the gift, if you would please, of salvation. It's legitimate. It's sincere. It's for the entire world. Yes, he foreknew and is very much aware that some are going to reject that gift. But that doesn't change the fact that the gift is given in sincerity. That doesn't change the fact that Jesus Christ came to save that which is lost. That doesn't change the fact that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's the total depravity of man. There's the unconditional election. There is a limited atonement. Now, uh, think about this. Uh, the, the irresistible grace. Now this will get you. Irresistible grace. In other words, now here's what they're saying so far. What they're saying is that God looks down over heaven and Jesus Christ did not die for the world. But he died for these whom God chose, and only these. I mean, only these right here did he die for that God chose. These are what you call the predestined ones. These are what you call the elect. And so, out of, out of all, okay, and so, it would be like this. And so, uh, God would look down, oh, if, if, if this doctrine was true. Now, I'm telling you, it's not true. It is not true. And when you hear somebody say, well, I tell you what, I think you ought to be a Calvinist. You ought to root back up, stand on your heels and say, I think you ought not to be a Calvinist. And here's what the Bible says. Okay. Now, wait a minute. But uh, these people that believe in Calvinism, here's what they say. They say, okay, God looked down over planet earth and uh, you, sir, are going to be saved. Stand up. You're saved. You, sir, are going to die and burn in hell. You, sir, are going to be saved. Stand up. You, sir, you're going to die and burn in hell. Now, wait a minute. That doesn't sound like a loving God to me. That doesn't sound like the Jesus that I know that came and shed his blood on Calvary so that everybody could be saved. All right? Thank you. Be seated. Watch this. But uh, now they go a step further. Now they say that is irresistible grace. Now, what's that mean? That means, sir, uh, Sean, stand up. That means this. That means, sir, you're going to get saved whether you want to get saved or not. You can't resist it. You just can't resist it. God says you're going to get saved. Now, I don't care if you want to be saved or not, son. You're going to get saved. Now, I'm sorry, uh, that's not Bible. God created man, thank you, be seated, with a free volitional will. The right to choose. You know why you came to church tonight? Can I tell you why you came to church tonight? You came to church tonight because you wanted to. Nobody made you come to church tonight. You came to church tonight because you said, well, I think I'll go learn more Bible because I love my God. And I just want to see more about my God so that I can please him more. I, I'm just curious about something else I could learn to be able to please God more. That's why you came. All right. Now, wait a minute. Watch this. And so they believe in the irresistible grace. Now, the Calvinists would say this, that a person uh, is to be saved, will not be able to resist it. It will be irresistible. Uh, they also believe this, that, uh, th that uh, uh, they will not be able to refuse the strong grace of God that urges them to salvation. They'll not be able to refuse the strong grace of God that urges them to salvation. I've seen people refuse. I preached a youth camp many years in North Carolina. I did my very best I, I, I was yielded to God, I prayed, I fasted, and uh, had a group of about 100 young people. That's about it. And uh, I preached to them. I remember just as sure as I'm standing here tonight, there was a teenage girl about third row back on the right-hand side, and uh, she was resisting God's grace. She was resisting the gift of God. She was resisting. And by the way, you could tell she was resisting. 
You know, she's holding on to the pew. And boy, I was up there preaching. I was running back and forth and, and hitting the pulpit and standing up on the pulpit. And I was giving it everything I've got. Sweat's running down my brow. And boy, I'm telling you, uh, I held them over hell for a long time. I wanted them to understand if they die without Christ, they're going to burn. And I, I mean, I made it sharp and I made it clear. And boy, I came, came time to an invitation and she's holding on to that pew. She is gripping her knuckles are turning white, you know, and, uh, and uh, she just did not want to get saved. Now, now, wait a minute. A couple of nights later, she did get saved, but she still had the choice not to be saved. I, I was preaching in, uh, I was preaching somewhere, uh, somewhere, I was, I promise. I was, I was, I was preaching uh, in North Carolina, King, that's where it was, King, North Carolina. And, uh, and I was preaching in Brother Holder, Brother Holder's Church, I think, or someplace like that. And uh, I forget who the fellow was, but I was preaching for somebody. And a uh, and 66-year-old woman, 66, been teaching Sunday school 22 years, 22 years. Honey, you remember that? You remember that? What church was that? Who was the fella? Yeah, that's the one. Okay, you, you're like I am. And 22 uh, years teaching Sunday school. And she walked the aisle, and she said, I, I, I have not, I have not, I have not ever received Jesus Christ as Savior. And God convicted me in this meeting, and I've been teaching Sunday school 22, 60-some years of it. And she said, I need to receive Christ tonight. Now, now, wait a minute. But all those years, she said no. It wasn't irresistible. Hello? I witnessed to my pop. Uh, I called my grandfather Pop. I witnessed to Pop over and over again, over and over again. I mean, uh, 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 you know, uh, now, now it's not the Pop that died on the, um, on, it was uh, the other granddad. I guess I should call him the other granddad. And I witnessed to him. And uh, uh, the one that died on the tractor, he died before I got saved. But the other grand, I just call him the other granddad. I witnessed to him. He wanted nothing to do with Christ. Nothing to do with Christ. Now, as far as I know, never received Christ. But that was a choice. Now, uh, he's in hell. I've got an uncle right now. Uncle. Uncle Bob. I love Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob was one of the highest paid employees of the Social Security. Uh, you sent him to Hawaii each year, and he thanked you. And uh, very, very good mathematician. Very good, very good. Very good businessman. Now, wait a minute. Uh, I've witnessed to Uncle Bob many, many times, many, many times, many, many times. He died of cancer two years ago. And uh, he was my brother's uncle, or my daddy's uncle, or my daddy's brother, my uncle, my daddy's brother. And, uh, but he died. Now, can I tell you, uh, 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 you know, it, there wasn't a Holy Ghost moving on him so much that he could not resist. He had a choice. Okay, let me hasten and go. Uh, so what, what does the Bible teach about this? Well, let me read it to you again, third time. Here it is. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Bible says, For the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering, it says to usward. It says, not willing that any, not willing, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Over in 1 Peter, uh, 1 Timothy rather, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse uh, 1, the Bible says, and this is a good and acceptable, it says, this is uh, uh, good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Listen to it now. Who will have all men to be saved. He didn't say just an elect few. He said, let me tell you what my will is. My will. My will is. All men get saved. Now, what's that mean? That means he wants the Jehovah Witnesses saved. That means that he wants the Catholics saved. That means that he wants uh, uh, the Christian science saved. Uh, men saved. That means that he wants the Church of Christ saved. That means he wants the Lutherans saved. That means he wants the Methodists saved. That means he wants the Presbyterians saved. That means, yes it does, yes it does. That means he wants the Baptists saved. He wants all men to be saved. That means he wants the, un, uh, 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 the non-religious person saved. The person that doesn't have any religion whatsoever they identify with. He wants everybody saved. All right? So he said here, he said, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21, the Bible says, uh, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Now he's talking to those that's in Galatia, Paul is. And these were those that were teaching uh, that uh, uh, salvation is by the law. They were teaching salvation is by the law. And Paul stood up. And he said this, he said, I'm not going to frustrate the grace of God. It's not by the law. 
And uh, he was teaching them the word of God. All right, so we understand this, that, that grace is not, stay with me now, it's not that which is uh, 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 irresistible, but I will tell you, listen, you can resist it to the point and to the place of not having salvation because it is the will of man. It's not the fact that all of a sudden uh, God comes on you and God uh, takes you down. No, 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 no. He's not going to force anybody to go to heaven. Amen. You know, a person can die and go to hell if they want to. I don't think you ought to want to, but you can. Statement number next. Statement number next. There is that which is the, uh, the, the perseverance of the saints. Now, what's that mean? Uh, the perseverance of the saints. Well, here's what the Calvinists believe. They believe that uh, uh, neither the members of a church nor, it says, of the elect can be saved unless, unless uh, they are the ones, if you will, that will persevere in holiness. So they believe that uh, you've got to be holy in order to be saved. Now, you, uh, I'm telling you, that's a work salvation. My, my Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, now, uh, they cannot, if you will, persevere in holiness without, and this is what they believe, continual watchfulness and effort. All right, so here, here's what we meant. Watch this, watch this. You ever hear somebody say, fall from grace, fall from grace, fall from grace? They say, well, I'll I tell you what, I was saved at one time, but I fell from grace. The only time you're going to fall from grace is if your wife is named Grace and you fall in her presence. But falling from grace, no, 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 my friend. You know, uh, once saved, always saved is what the Bible teaches, okay? And so I, I must disagree. So, so uh, you, think about, you think about Noah. If you go according to this right here, this Calvinistic view of that which is a, a perseverance of that of the saints, if you go, if you go that way, then here's what you believe about Noah. He was hanging on the outside of the ark and never got in because God wanted to make sure that he was going to be holy enough in order to get in. So he's hanging outside on those wooden pegs and, and God wasn't going to let him in. No. He didn't have to prove himself to get in. Jesus Christ died for sinners. Okay? All right? Uh, but, uh, but God opened the door. God shut the door. God, if you will, uh, sealed the door. All right? But there are those that believe that uh, you have to do more than just receive Jesus Christ. I mean, after all, you have to be the one that's persevering. Now, I will tell you this. Uh, you don't have to persevere the Savior, and we are uh, preserved we are preserved. So once I'm saved, it's like preserves, if you will. My, my, my grandmother used to put up preserves. How many had parents or so, uh, maybe grandparents, or, or you read about it somewhere in a dusty history book about putting up preservatives? Did that somewhere? Okay. My grandmother put up preserves, and uh, uh, she would heat up those uh, mason jars, and she'd get them just right, and, uh, and then she would take and she'd pour the preservatives in there. It might be peaches or pears, or it might be apples, or whatever the case may be, and she cooked them real good, and uh, she'd put them in there, and then she'd put that, that, plast or that uh, wax topping on there, and then she'd uh, let it cool down, and it would seal it, and then she'd take and, uh, that, that, that lid, you know, she'd put that metal lid on there, and then she'd screw that uh, that metal round uh, screw down on that metal lid and seal it real good. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, right before she preserved some, we ate some. But she could open that up a week later, and it's still preserved, and it still tastes the way it did when she preserved it. Now, stay with me now. You could open that same preservative up a year later, and it would still taste the very same way that it was on the day that she preserved it. Stay with me now. You could open that thing up years later, and uh, it would still taste the very same way that she did when she preserved it. Now, why is that so? Because, you see, God is in the preserving business. And when you receive Jesus Christ as Savior, you, sir, ma'am, are preserved. Amen. Are preserved. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, here's the last verse I'll show you, but 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. The Bible says, 
who are kept, it says, by the power of God through faith on the salvation, ready to be revealed, listen to it now, at the last time. So you're perver- preserved onto the day of, okay, you know, the Bible says this. The Bible says that when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, and I love that verse, don't you, over in the book of Revelation, the Bible says death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life uh, was cast in the lake of fire. Don't you love that little portion right there where it says book of life? Because here's what God does. Here's what God does. Uh, You receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, and God takes your name, and he writes your name in the book of life. And according, uh, I believe it's in Ephesians, that he seals it onto the day of redemption. You ever see or read about or uh, know of uh, a king that would take the crest uh, that's on the family ring that is holy, but yet it represents uh, uh, the authorization. Uh, it represents the power, the dignity of that unit of family or of that particular uh, group that's there in that kingdom. And the king would take the crest and, uh, uh, that's on the ring and he'll put it down and that which is wax and he'll lift it up and he'll seal it, that document. And it is sealed by the family crest. All right, now wait a minute. Did you know when you got saved, here's what God did, God sealed you. God sealed you onto the day of redemption. What is that? That's the gathering of the saints. All right, so once that you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're sealed. You say, oh, preacher, I, 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 uh, I, uh, I do bad. I don't do good all the time, okay, all right? But if you're the the son or the daughter of your mama and you do bad, you're still the son or the daughter of your mama. Now, you may lose fellowship, but you do not lose relationship. When our children were uh, bad, uh, uh, you know, when they were booger heads, we would send them to the room and we'd say, go to the room and wait on us. And we'd send them into the bedroom. And, uh, uh, you know, you've done wrong. Go in there and think about it. I'll be in there a little bit and we'll take care of business. Now, wait a minute. But we'd send them in there. Now, wait a minute. They did wrong. Now, it separated them from me when it came from f- to fellowship, but it never separated the son or the daughter from the dad or from the mom. You know why? Because you were birthed into the family. Now, you don't get unbirthed. You can't go to God tonight as much as you might want to and say, God, take it back. I'm tired of being a Christian. God's going to look at you and say, uh, 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 too bad, so sad. He'll say that probably in the Hebrew tongue. But but you, because you can't take it back. Once you're saved, you're saved. Once you receive Jesus Christ, you're saved. God gives you eternal life. Eternal life is non-negotiable. You didn't work to get it. You can't work to keep it. Okay? Now, but wait a minute. Aren't you glad that we have a church that believes that anybody at any time can bow the heart, understanding the the simplicity of the gospel, and receive Jesus Christ as Savior. And when they do that, God writes their name in the book of life, and it is sealed onto the day of redemption, the gathering of the saints. And you and I, as believers, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So you take your last breath here, the very next breath you take is in heaven, done. Done, according to the scriptures. Isn't that good? Now, Father, bless we do pray.